Good evening. Welcome back to Expert Insights. I'm your host, Raj Shuman Hian. We are still on the subject matter of interpersonal and organizational excellence. Our guest, Kate Jones, ABP CRM Sales, is here to tell us how to take excellence at the structural level. Kate Jones, welcome to Expert Insights. It's my honor being here with you tonight, Raj. Tell me a little bit about yourself, Mr. Jones. Well, that's a big story, so I'll try to concise it down for you. Okay. Right? So I've been in the Philippines about four years, uh, and I came here. Uh, my background is from the Bahamas. My grandfather was from the Bahamas. There, they only had a handful of uh, islands where in the Philippines they have 7,107 at high tide. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, coming to the Philippines was kind of coming back home to me. and I had never been in Asia before. So putting that on top of that, as well as my, uh, my love of diving. So those are really the three things that brought, brought me here. You here. What were you doing in Bahamas again? Sorry. Oh, uh, bah Bahamas is uh, where my grandfather is from. So oh, he migrated oh. from the Bahamas. Oh, so you were a Bahamian. You got Bahamian, right, right. Bahamian. In, fa in fact, bah Bahamian. In fact, I used to take, uh, in the summers, I used to take what's called, what we call there, the goat boat over from one island to the next. It's goat just boat? Like goat. Goat, goat boat. Goat boat. It's just a big banca with lots of supplies on it. Now you, we used to so you did grow up there as a kid, not in New York. No, no, no. I just went to the summers there. Oh, uh, okay, summers there. It's okay. Like you know, like summer, mm -hmm. you go somewhere else to visit. I oh, went back. I don't know that. This is summer all the time <laughs> in this country. We have three summers here. So you are now the ABP CRM sales of the NCO group, Correct. and you've been in this country for three, two years. Huh? Four years. Wow! Four years wow! Now. So give us a little uh, picture of what the NCO group is all about. I would love to. Yeah. So, so NCO is like any BPO, business processing outsourcing group, mm -hmm. and that we, our, our, our role is to take, um, to take customers from our clients and deliver on great customer satisfaction, sales or technical support, or general customer service for our customers, voice and non-voice. So we do it both. And we're actually in, we've been around for over 80 years in over uh, 15 countries. So we, we, we have a pretty de a broad depth of experience in this. So the business of uh, outsourcing existed 80 years ago or was NCO doing something else 80 years ago? Right. So if you think about outsourcing, right, there's so many facets of it, people don't even realize the depth of that. Uh, so 80 years ago, we were doing collections. Oh, so you were like the money lenders guy. <laughs> yeah, <what>? yeah. <laughs> great, great. Uh, I, 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 a little distingu distinguished from that. So what people would do is they would lend money. Right. They could not collect on that money. Right, so they right. would come to us and say, oh. could you collect for us? Right. So, so they're outsourcing their collections. So did the NCO gr uh, group uh, rise up in Chicago in the 50s and 60s? <laughs> Actually, it's headquarters at a pretty sleepy town called Horsham, Pennsylvania. All right. Uh, so, uh, oh, but it was a family business. Um, the father passed it to his grand, uh, the grandfather passed it to his grandson, and his grandson has uh, was at the helm for about 25 years. Well, what does the what are the words uh, letters NCO stand for? Good question. Right now, it doesn't stand for anything, but at some point, it was National Collection Organization. National Collection. Okay. But right now, now, it doesn't stand for anything. So uh, that's the BPO industry. That's the business of BPO. Today in the Philippines, Philippines is doing really good. Absolutely. In terms of voice and also non-voice. Huh? Yeah. So what is your uh, perception of Philippines? How is it doing today? And where, where does it go in the next decade or so? Yeah. Great question. Right now, the Philippines has had, uh, <laughs> has had over not, uh, a decade of great progress in the BPO industry. And we project that it'll grow another 20% for the next five years, according to BPAP, which is the, uh, the uh, governmental head of BPOs in the uh, Philippines. In the Philippines. Right. So uh, great bandwidth to go, great bandwidth to go there. I think the, I think the thing that from an, an industry structure that we're looking for is that the Philippines has to claim that stake, that it will be the world leader in the BPO. And what do I mean by that? What do you mean by yeah, that? So what I mean is that um, right now, that past 10 decades, we've kind of just rode the wave. It's been a very good wave. It's like, you know, walking in the dark and just grabbing what you right. can. Yeah? Taking, taking work because people want to bring it yeah, here. Yeah. The Philippines needs to transform itself to become a center of excellence for the BPO industry within the world. It doesn't exist in any country right now. Has somebody put a stake in the ground and said, we will be 
the country of center of excellence. And being 93 million people uh, and the 95. third... 95. 95 now, mm -hmm. it grows yeah. every second. Uh, 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 with uh, the third largest English-speaking country in the world, the Philippines has a great opportunity to carve out for itself a niche that's global. And, and the reasons are the size, the size, the population, the, the, population, the demographic, the ability the language, to speak English, and the, the cultural affinity. The service culture. The service, service culture, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, if it's been just uh, groping in the dark for the last 10 years and it's still done good, how does it stand against other countries that are coming up in the BP industry? India, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil. Uh, yeah. What makes Philippines the most potential in terms of being the center of excellence for the world BP industry? So, I, I think, I think we, we kind of touched on those third largest English speaking country in the yeah, world, yeah. the culture that, ha that has the ability to do it. Um, I think what's, what's central is that the value proposition that Filipinos bring to the table is enormous. Mm -hmm. They have to keep that value proposition, mm -hmm. and the way they do that is not lower wages or lower cost, but it's better value, meaning delivering on customer service and interaction, whether it's non-voice or mm -hmm. voice. That's what's going to make this place a center of excellence globally. Now, now you are a specialist. You are a strategist when it comes to doing this. Absolutely. No? Now, uh, I want to ask you a question how to go about this. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, is the Philippine government part and parcel of this endeavor? Are mm -hmm. they gunning for the BP industry to be the best in the world? I, 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 my, my impression right now is they are not. Currently, there, there's, the there's current no, there's administration or the past one? Correct. They're, they're not focused on it being the best in the world. They're focused on, hey, it's a great opportunity for our people uh, to rise out of poverty, and there's a great economics that are behind it. But they haven't coalesced mm. around it and said, let's ensure we build the infrastructure, let's b ensure we build the right schooling, let's ensure we b build the right partnerships to the table, so that as a center, we can stake, a, uh, stake our claim and say, we'll we're building. We'll have a definite game plan. Exactly. But at the last CCAP conference, July 30, I was part of that, yeah. seemed like everyone was gung-ho. Uh, the mayor of Taguig was there, the Department of Trade was there, and so was the CCAP, the Association of the Private Industries. They all seemed gung-ho and they seemed to have a plan, they seemed confident, and yet you're saying that there should be something more. Agreed. I'll okay. give you an example. All right. Purdue University. Not Purdue? Purdue In University, States, yeah. yep. Not, yeah. A, not a small university with, yeah. with some pedigree behind it, right? Yeah. They actually have a, uh, a degree, a master's and a PhD degree in customer service marketing. Gee, I've never heard of that. Right? Yeah. And, and so, uh, um, and uh, they had a great professor, Dr. Anton, who actually created this center of excellence at the university. And people would actually migrate to the university just to become part of that center of excellence. Uh, um, businesses and other universities would tap into <coughs> Dr. Anton and his structure so that they could learn all the science and art behind the company. So thus, 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 it's not just the heart behind service excellence, yeah. but there has to be some intellect and brain behind it. Absolutely. That's what Dr. Anton is putting out. So what Absolutely. are the elements of his uh, discipline that he's saying? What are uh, so his, his, his elements of discipline, for example, yeah. um, when we talk about customer service, it's really a, there's a science behind customer service. Why do, why do customers buy and come back? And over time, if you think about it, this is kind of funny. The first call center, you know where it was? Mm, let me try and guess. Okay. Uh, somewhere in middle America. <laughs> and uh, they were probably selling... Uh, stuff made in the U.S. in the 60s? The first call center is any office that had a phone. And the customer called. The customer called and said, I have a problem. Right? It was a telephone operator. Uh, yeah, it was a, not even a telephone operator. Just somebody in the office picking up the phone and saying, uh, this is uh, Raju's uh, headquarters enterprise. How can right. I help you? That, that, that's, that's the call center. Right? Thanks for calling Raju. This is Raju <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. Okay. And so if, if you think about it, over the past 20 years, it's involved from one person picking up a phone to, to having thousand. thousands of people and being more efficient at picking up a phone. Okay. And first companies viewed it as an expense. I have to answer the phone. Then they moved to the next uh, level of understanding is, hey, I can actually turn customers and make them happy. 
next level is, hey, I can actually make them buy more. I can upsell them over right. time. Right. And then the next real phase as we go on and we think out the next 20 years is, how do I take those interactions, those voice of the customers, if I take all those listening posts, whether it's on a blog, whether it's an email, whether it's a, a mail, a fax, whatever, how can I take all that, that, uh, those listening posts and actually put data behind what the customer is saying and then take that data and improve sales, improve marketing, improve logistics. Say an example, what can I do with, I'm in the training industry and I put out a newsletter, I get phone calls, I attend trade shows and events and conferences. How do I capture data and take the best out of the data to serve my market a bit more? What, what do I do? What? So, in, in, you in know, my case, in, which is simple. I, I'm, I'm not going to give you your case because yeah. I don't know it intimately, but right. I'm going to okay. give you an intimate case that, yeah. that one of many that I have done to yeah. highlight your question, right? Mm -hmm. How do I take that data <laughs> and translate it? Yeah. So, when I talk about sustainable excellence and becoming a strategic asset, think of this you take a computer manufacturer. Yeah. And which I answer the calls for that computer manufacturer. I might answer 6,000 calls a day for that computer and manufacturer. And I might be answering technical questions or exactly. billing questions, stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what we did is we actually said, let's listen to the types of calls. Let's listen to what the customer is saying. And then let's listen to the actual comments, uh, uh, the comments from the customers. And then we looked across all of that and we could look through the data and we could say, hey, there was something about products that came frequently in all of those pieces. And then we could say, what types of products were they were? In my scenario, what we did is we actually found that hard drives was a product that customers were complaining about. So we then said, okay, who makes your hard drive? We found that 13 different manufacturers made their hard drives. Right. We then said, which hard drive lasts the longest and costs the least? We were able to come up with three. We then said to the computer manufacturer, if you transfer your production to these three manufacturers, your business will shift. Your business will shift. In fact, so, so you did your R&D in there, you did your market research there, you did your cu customer insights just there through the daily interactions or the daily communication. Correct. That was, that's the science behind That's the science behind And that science yielded, that, compu that computer manufacturer, it yielded them $1.3 million in benefit to them because of that research we did. That's not a number that we put on it. That's a number that they checked off. So NCO does this for your clients? So whether it's computers or some other product? Whatever product. Yeah. This, this, this particular a scenario. consumable product. Correct. This particular scenario was not at NCO, but it's the same principle of how do you take sustainable excellence, yeah. right? Understanding the voice of the customer, yeah. and then translate that into a strategic asset for the client. Fantastic, fantastic. Now at the government level, going back to that question that we, uh, right. we did cover, but can you give us an idea on what can we do? What, what are the possibilities in assuring and speeding the fact that we become the center of ex excellence globally? It, it, so so he, here's maybe uh, a few pieces of a roadmap that I would point out. I would say first, within the government body, I would set up a center of excellence for BPO industry. Just we, that, just that. Just that alone, just that alone. So what would if this be comprised of, private and public? Or? Private and public. If you think of PESA, right? Right yeah. now, PESA is a center of excellence for getting businesses up and started within the Philippines. And they've had great success. They've eliminated uh, or minimized anything of graft and corruption, but speed of execution and getting businesses start, started up. If you had that same government body. Similar. Similar. Yeah. government body with partnerships from private and public and they could build not only roads and electrical and, and buildings etc but they could integrate it throughout the entire country that says the next great hub is Davao the next great hub is uh, Baguio Kagi and Dioro, yeah. uh, Dioro right but working with it and, and the interesting thing is is already to your point a lot of interest in this in terms of the call center industry but if you took BPAP and made BPAP and combined it maybe with CCAP and said from a government body perspective, we will be the center of excellence and we, will, we globally will be the best in the business at both voice and non-voice. Two questions. From the government side, is DTI the one 
who spearheads the growth of the call center in the BPO industry or is it SITEM or is it uh, some other department? Is it DTI? Uh, I, so I, I'm, I'm not f familiar with DTI just enough to say they spearhead it. Yeah. My, my, my better so who would come together to create the center of excellence just like PESA? You I, don't know, you I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And the second question is there was a uh, slight chuckle on your part when you said CCAP. So would you want to explain that chuckle? Well, um, my view is um, you have BP, uh, BPAP and you have CCAP. They both want to promote the, the BPO industry in the Philippines. Oh, so there is no need. Join resources. Just merge. Partnerships. Yeah. Right? And accelerate the growth. Which one is tied up with NASCOM? BPAP uh, or CCAP? BPAP. Or the former one. So BPO, BPAP covers everything, while CCAP covers only the voice related industry. Well, they, 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 they do both, yeah. but uh, BPAP has uh, um, a strong ability to reach out globally, and they go to conferences globally, and they promote the Philippines globally. So they have more tie-ups, so Correct. they can merge it. Now, uh, another thing, you know, these are questions other than uh, the, uh, the potential of the B, uh, BPO industry. What are the side effects? Thinking of systems thinking, thinking of interdependence. What are the residual effects to the community, to society of BPO industry? What, are your what is your take on that? Well, you know, there, there, there are common thoughts right now yeah. that you have uh, people who, uh, I, I, I think it was really uh, interesting, um, one of the first companies I worked with and the head of the company said, you know, when you started out in the BPO industry, it was, it was really uh, a dicey in the sense that young girls would, uh, you know, dress up around 10 p.m., put nice clothes on, makeup on, yeah. uh, leave the house, yeah. and stay out all night, uh, and then come back home with big wads of cash. And so, so the people would say... <laughs> it seems like the oldest profession in the world. Right, right. It seems like the oldest profession in the world. So some of, some of, that, uh, some of, that, some of, some of that stigma uh, still is present uh, because uh, uh, people in the industry, they end, they the end their shift. It's night time. It's night time. They end their shift. Yeah. And just like you, or, or not me because I still work at night, but uh, colleagues who work during the day, you might go out and have a drink or you might socialize after that. They're doing the same thing. It's just in the morning. So there is stigma associated with that. Keith, but there's also a, there's a biological effect. I think the human body is designed to agreed. work by day and not by I, night. I so agree. how about that one? Do you agree yeah. to yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that there, yeah. there are health risks with working long, t long periods at, at so night. How do you mitigate that? How do you offset that? Can something yeah. be done in terms of technology or the hours that we cater to the global uh, needs of so so we talked about voice and we talked about non-voice non -voice, right okay, so yeah. the beauty of non-voice yeah. which is really the biggest segment of the mm. possible market in the globe right now non-voice non -voice is bigger than oh, yeah, yeah. By, by at least three times yeah. bigger than voice right that can be done at any time during the day yeah okay right? that can be slightly delayed or the, well, it, 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 it's, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not time sensitive. Right, right. Uh, I have to immediately pick up and talk with somebody, right? right? right so, right. so expanding that part of the market for the Philippines will make a balance. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you, if you know this, you, you may probably on this know this already. We have doctors and nurses on site. We have clinics. Uh, in our uh, in our facilities as well, so that helps mitigate that as well. Will there always be some residual effect from that? Absolutely, because you're messing with the uh, the human clock. But the expanding uh, non-voice is a great way to minimize that. So that's that. part of the strategy that you would recommend to Philippines absolutely. The country. Absolutely. Now uh, we talk about the growth of the BPU industry being a bit sporadic, uh, groping in the dark, and still succeeding. But it has grown in a certain way that. There are small uh, restaurants and there are uh, dormitories coming up and they're coming up really sporadic. It's not like planned structured growth. What about that? That's going to have a negative effect 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line in how a country's uh, city is being structured. What about that one? So um, uh, a lot of uh, people in the call center, they do actually 
move closer to the center, right? And yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. right, and, and, and that impacts that, right? But let's make short-term responses to real-time needs. If there was, if there was a global center of excellence, we could then actually could bring, we that. could actually build communities around that and have a whole design and system, as your friend Peter Senge would say, around that think view. Far, think, think far, think far, right? Think Not short-term. That's why I say if, if you had a center of excellence that looked out the next 10 to 20 years and designed facilities like that, just like you have um, um, IT hubs. They have several in India. Right? And, and there, there, are, there, yeah. there's one in, there was one big one in Cebu. Um, the, w having more of those, and call it global contact center hubs. Mm. You know, with that view in their tape. So big and term. no other country, the, the beauty of it is no other country, as I know it, has a government body that is established to promote the BPO industry. It's not going away. The market is in excess of uh, tw uh, $200 billion globally. It's not going away. The access is $200 billion globally. Today, we are, today we are at $9 billion in the Philippines. In the, in the Philippines, Which globally. Is, yeah, I'm talking billion. globally, yeah. Back yeah. office, non-voice. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Keith? Thank you very much for those wonderful yes, insights. I have so many more questions coming from you, but <laughs> time's up and we'll catch up on this some other time. Is there anything you'd like to say to your friends in the community of the business? You are in the BP industry. I, 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 th I think what I would say to uh, the, Filip the Filipino community and country is this. You have a diamond here. Don't lose it. This is an opportunity that you shouldn't Absolutely. miss. The next 10, 20 years, maybe more. Absolutely. Maybe more. It's, it's happened to other countries, right? So don't miss this. Don't miss this opportunity. Okay, one question. This question comes from you. You said, Raj, you asked me what is the most beautiful place you have visited in the Philippines and describe that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the most beautiful place that I've been with my significant other, which is Nika Pineda, is in Dumaguete, um, off the island of Apo. Uh, there is a beautiful enclave right there, towering rocks. The beach is white. It's hard to get to, and it's only one hotel on that particular spot. What's that spot called? Uh, it's it's uh, Apo, uh, Apo, I think it's Apo, uh, Apo Island. Uh, Apo? Uh, Apo Island. Island, but this one particular part of Apo Island. Yeah. No, no running water, no electricity after 6 o'clock, but this and resort is beautiful, and I would highly recommend you go there. All right, Keith, and last question is, five years, ten years down the line, do you plan to leave the, leave, leave the Philippines or stay here? So, I'm a global leader. Yeah. I do plan to eventually leave the Philippines, All right. but I always have my heart here. All right. Mabu, hi. Gracias. So, that was Keith Jones from NCO Group and he talked about how the BPO industry is set to grow in the Philippines and we should take that opportunity. Next week on Expat, Expat Insights, we'll have the ambassador of Brazil, Alcides Prates, and you can contact us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter too. Our website is www.expatinsights.com, and you can watch this um, episode on YouTube too in a couple of weeks. Good night and mabuhai.